but our first storyteller is Daniel Perea. And Daniel is a storyteller, a writer, an actor, and he says he's an aspiring troubadour, which I love. Like, who says that? Isn't that wonderful? Oh, someone said, oh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's great. And he loves to regale people with tales of his own neuroses, don't we all? <laughs> what I love to say about Daniel is that um, I met him through a mutual friend, and I learned about him that he had been living in L.A., and in his early 20s, he sold a sci-fi script in Hollywood. Who does that? He was like, you know, the first time out of the, the gate he sold it. And um, so uh, moving back to Gainesville was a little bit of a transition from Los Angeles. I don't know if you can, like, picture that. Um, <clears throat> but he was looking for different ways to put his voice on stage, and we got Daniel. Okay? So this uh, welcome Daniel to the stage, if you will. How's it going? <laughs> All right, so let's just get right into this. Um, I was born here in Gainesville on Friday the 13th, so I'm a little superstitious. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I attract bad luck. Um, what I will say is that there have been moments in my life that seem to go spectacularly wrong and um, every time it happens I sort of just think to myself yeah 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 that kind of makes sense when I was a kid my school would take me and my classmates to Crystal River and we would rent scuba masks and wetsuits and we would spend the day exploring now, I don't know how many of you have been out to Crystal River. If you haven't been out there yet, I highly recommend it because the water's just this shade of blue that says, like, humans haven't been dicking around with me yet. Like, it's really nice. I don't consider myself a particularly adventurous person. I kind of like consistency in my life. I was the kid who, okay, when I was in kindergarten, I, uh, I went up to my mother and I pulled her aside and I very pointedly told her, mom, I'm not going to first grade next year. I like kindergarten. I kind of like feel what kindergarten's all about. I get the vibe and I like it. <laughs> the year after that, I end up in first grade, pull my mother aside again. I don't know how you did that. I don't know how I ended up here, um, but I like it here now, and everybody's talking about this second grade, and uh, I don't really think I need it. I'm okay with the education level that I have here in first grade. I think I can get through life with a first grade education. Thank you, though. I appreciate this. Now, I would like to be able to say that this tendency to kind of stick to what's known and what's comfortable um, went away as I became an adult. That would not be true. Um, when I was 15, I went to Boston for a sleepaway camp, and it was my first time away from home for an extended period of time. Um, within 24 hours of landing in Boston, I called my mom on the phone and just begged her to fly out to Boston and come to pick me up because I was mortified. Um, within a day, she calls me. She's like, are you okay? Like, how's it going out there? I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I met a couple kids. We're just going out for dinner now. We're going to go hang out, maybe watch a movie. She's like, Okay. Three years later, again, in Boston, I'm heading to my first day in college. Um, and I'm taking the subway there. But I have to make a quick detour. Um, I get off at a random tea stop, and I puke in a trash barrel. And my mom has to explain to a horrified onlooker. It's, you know, it's his first day of college. It's just yeah, a little bit of jitters. I like to know the rules in my life. When I start to recognize that things are changing around me, I tend to get scared. That's just how I react. I've always been kind of drawn to movies. Movies make a lot of sense to me. They kind of have this internal logic that they operate on. For example, like, if a girl starts off a movie lonely, she's by herself, the guy 
that she has a crush on in high school doesn't like her back. You can kind of tell that by the end of the movie, if it's a rom-com, she's probably going to get the guy. Or like, you know, if a prisoner is racked with guilt over something that he did, whatever crime he committed, by the end of the movie, he's probably going to find redemption for it. Or, you know, if you're watching Law and Order, it's always the guy who gives the donuts to the detectives at the beginning of the episode who's like, hey, I work across the street. I've been, you know, seeing these people for a while. It's just such a shame what happened. It's always that guy. And, like, you would figure after so many seasons of Law and Order, the detectives would figure out that it's always that guy, but... I don't know, I guess the show's gotta keep running. My point being, we all kind of know these rules, and we all kind of know that life isn't really like the movies. Just because you have feelings for somebody doesn't really mean that they owe you affection. Just because you're sorry for something doesn't mean you're gonna be forgiven. People get sick. People become president. (laughs) And, uh... From a glance, there's really no discernible logic to any of it. It just sort of happens, and then you kind of have to deal with it. So, there I am in the water, this timid little boy, far outside of his comfort zone. I get separated from my friends, and I see this murky silhouette approaching me, and I don't quite know what it is, but it's getting closer. It was a manatee. It was a big manatee. It was the biggest manatee I have seen in my entire life. Like, I don't, I don't know if obesity exists for manatees. If it does, this guy needs to bring his BMI down, stat. Like, it was getting to that point. So this huge creature is coming at me, and I'm kind of like, I don't know what to do. Like, what if this thing gets angry? Or what if this thing gets hungry? Like, do manatees eat people? I don't know. And this is before you can just whip your phone out and look it up underwater. Like, I would have to go home before I could find out that information. In the meantime, I'm just looking at this thing. So I look into its eyes, and... The minute you look into a manatee's eyes, I mean, there's a reason that they're called sea cows. Like, this thing does not have a malicious bone in its body. Like, you would be hard-pressed to find any bones in this thing's body, (laughs) but it didn't mean me any harm. So, I stick my hand out, and I kind of pet its head, and it doesn't feel the way I thought that it would. It's kind of rough, and it's slimy, and it's covered in kelp which is really interesting. She knows. And um, yeah, it sort of responds to my touch in a way that I wasn't expecting it to. Like I thought this thing was gonna bite my hand off at first, but um, instead it just sort of keeps moving. So I start petting its back. And in my mind I'm thinking like, this is a really cinematic moment. This is kind of beautiful. Like in the movie of my life, this seems like a a cathartic experience where like the young boy figures out that he doesn't have to be so scared all the time and he can like put himself out into the world and that there's new adventures that he can explore. So that's the way it feels to me. The manatee starts turning over and it takes a while because this thing's like the size of a submarine, but eventually it gets over to its stomach. And I start rubbing its stomach, and I'm like, this is some free willy shit. Like, I have, like, a relationship with this creature. So I'm just rubbing it, and I'm like, man, you know, sometimes there are pure moments in life. Like, sometimes you just have a moment that is perfect. And as I'm rubbing this manatee's stomach, it takes a giant shit that just pops right up to the surface of the water. So, (laughs) shut it down, you know what I mean? Like, moments over, I just helped an animal empty its bowels. I was soothing it. (laughs) So this just went from a story about a young boy kind of embracing nature in all of its forms to a young boy learning that nature is quite literally just full of shit. Like, shit happens everywhere. And it's messy, and... 
to me, this is like, it just feels like Friday the 13th incarnate. Like, of course this would happen in my life. Of course this beautiful moment would be interrupted by just a gigantic turd. (laughs) I've thought about that moment a lot since it happened, just growing up. And the older I get, the more it makes me laugh because if I hadn't had this majestic, beautiful creature just defecate right in front of me, like, I would not remember that at all. It would probably just kind of fade into the background, like a lot of things that happened growing up where I thought, this is a really meaningful moment, this is something that's gonna stand out, and then as you get older, it just kind of fades. I certainly wouldn't be here telling you guys about it, but I am. And that's kind of a lesson in and of itself. I learned more from that happening than I would if that moment had been perfect. And what I learned is that life is messy and it's rough and it's slimy and it's covered in kelp and sometimes you get to pet a manatee. And that's pretty cool. That's my story. Thank you very much. (laughs) 